The case regarding the 2016 robbery of a million dollars in Rolex watches at Jewelers International has been dismissed. A pledge to bring much needed reforms to cassava production and marketing and progress in mountain chicken conservation. I am Julian Morris with the Channel 5 News. The details after this. First up, the case against those arrested in 2016 in connection with the alleged robbery at the Fort Chung Hotel branch of Jewelers International has been dismissed for want of prosecution. 45 Rolex watches valued at over $1.8 million were allegedly stolen during the robbery which took place on 21st of May 2016. Elrado Duque, Craig Christian and Cynthia Dorset were charged with conspiracy to rob Jewelers International. Duque is delighted that the matter is over. From my perspective now, the, the, the feeling is, is, is somewhat something I need to, be, to, to restore. From, from my perspective now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that, that the court can finally come to that judgment. It's, it's long overdue that, that they had that judgment to, to, to make. But it's, it's lack of evidence from the, from the prosecution, and that's, that's what they, they had from the beginning, nothing to deal with, and up to today they have nothing to deal with. And I, I, I spent over 100 and something days in prison, innocent of a crime I didn't commit. So I'm just happy that the court and, and, and justice, let justice prevail, and that's the justice system. I'm happy that with the outcome. Duque says he's contemplating taking civil action to restore his reputation. As the, the, the court proceeding was, was along, it's, it's something that I've been discussing and working together with my lawyer closely. It's my intention to restore my reputation to proceed with court action and civil action against whatever it is that or whoever it is that I have to do it against. It's, it's something that I'm looking forward to do because that's the only way I see that I can get my reputation restored. In other news, parliamentary representative for the Pitit Savan constituency is reassuring residents of the Erika ravaged community that government is committed to seeing to it that they are comfortably relocated in due time. Currently, construction work is ongoing in Belleville Chopin for the new Pitit Savan resettlement. Daru says government has paid a significant sum of money in rent to the various establishments your residents live, and there has been regular communication with them. I'm really happy and satisfied with the way the government ha has responded to the Pitit Savan residents. In fact, um, I think we're going to have problems getting them from where they are currently to bring them to Belleville Chopin. Um, the complaints are a lot less, almost none at all. Um, the government, of course, we know have committed into paying the rent for them until such a as they're permanently relocated. Displacement allowances are also part of the package that they're receiving. So every now and then, you know, you hear people make it appear, you know, that they've been abandoned, you know, the Pity Seven people and stuff, you know. And I really would beg to differ. I mean, after all what I've said, you know, that um, I, I think this is an unprecedented um, move by the government to really take care of people that way. To those who remain in Pitit Savan after the storm, Daru says it's not safe practice, it's not a safe practice. However, he admits that those who choose to stay cannot be forced to leave. And while I understand the emotions attached to, to the community, hey, I go to Pitit Savan ever so often myself, you know. Um, and I understand the emotions, you know, people have been there for their life and people would have invested, you know, invested, etc., in their homes, etc. But people need to understand that was an act of nature, an act of God that none of us had control over. And as I said, I stand. 2,000, 1 million trillion, according to my son, zillion percent being the government's decision to ask people to move. And, and even now and then, if you people who, who remain, um, they can tell you how they feel anytime and there's some inclement weather, you understand me, and they hear the river raging and all of this, you know. The PAL rep say, says overall he's pleased with the progress on the site at Belleville Chopin so far. Those of you who would have visited Belleville Chopin in recent days would have seen tremendous progress. A lot of excavation work, a lot of preparatory work has already been done. And even as we speak, um, the foundations for the first set of homes are being, are being done. Um, and simultaneously with this, um, we, we have a lot of a number of other amenities that of course is going to be um, that's going to be um, that's going to be necessary for, for modern um, community. A contract was signed in June last year with a Canadian firm for the construction of the modern settlement for the Pitit Savan residents. The Mountain Chicken Project is reporting progress made in its efforts to conserve the island's treasure, the Mountain Chicken or Crapo. The project was launched in 2002 at a time when the chytrid fungus threatened the extinction of the frog. It is being spearheaded by the Forestry, Wildlife and Parks Division and has received support from the London Zoological Society. 
Amphibian technician Marshall Sultan says encouraging signs are being noticed, including the fact that the amphibians are now surviving despite having a percentage of the fungus in them. We can say right now we have 137 tag frogs that we know that are out there surviving. Or we can see the population is at least around 250 because there are places that have frogs but we cannot access it because of the terrain of the um, forest or the area that we're surveying. So what we do, there's a thing that we call listening checks. So we just stay about 30 minutes and listen and count the amount of frogs that we're hearing. And also we have frogs that we have that are tagged with a chip in the back. So we, when we catch that frog, we can scan it and get all its information. So we have a database of how, how it's been progressing in the wild. So we can see that we know that there are 147 tag frogs surviving and the places that we've not been able to survey, but we do listening check that we can see at least there's about 250 frogs out there. Monitoring of the mountain chicken population in the wild takes place at least twice weekly. And we can tell the general public that the frogs are coming back. It's still early, but we are seeing positive signs that they are breeding in the wild. We are finding young juveniles, so we know that they are out there producing now. Another thing that we've been finding out now through, through surveying and studies, well, research study on the frog, is that they are now surviving for a percentage of the disease. So before, when they got sick with the chytrid disease, they would actually die off. But right now we're finding that some frogs have the disease and they are surviving out there. It is still too early to say that they actually are developing a resistance, but so far that is what we're seeing. So that is very much positive signs for the mountain chicken frog. Mm -hmm. More news now, a team of 14 student nurses from, the Barb from Barbados on a study tour here this week say they may adopt some of the best practices in Dominica's primary healthcare system. The team from the Barbados Community College, which is about to wrap up a week-long visit here, is being exposed to the outstanding delivery of public health in Dominica. The Barbados Community College and the nursing division here have enjoyed a mutually beneficial relationship for years. The Barbados Community College is proud to have trained many of your own community health nursing staff and we pledge to continue to do so. We also encourage that you continue to choose Barbados as your place to send your students for training. As we promote the creation of learning networks linked at the importance of human resource for health for the achievement of the goal of universal health coverage grounded in the development of health systems based on primary health care and the improvement of the health and well-being of individuals, families and communities. Barbados currently needs an increase in their nursing population and Springer is hoping this training will begin to address dwindling staff numbers. The drop in the number of primary health care nurses in Barbados is due to retirement. The demand for our primary health care has increased significantly and especially you know, with the downturn of, of the economy, persons losing their jobs and so forth, we have a lot more individuals who are now entering our health system, our primary health care system. Persons who would have opted previously to go to their private doctors, they are now coming into our primary health care system. So that influx, we have doubled the population that would have normally come into us at the primary health care level. While well, here, the visiting nursing students will have interacted with community health nurses and other members of the health teams. Primary health care nurses are key players in the achievement of universal access to health and the sustainable development goals. The nursing division has expressed a commitment to continue providing support for the visiting colleagues who have chosen Dominica as a model of best practice. And a retired senior educator believes students should be exposed to technical and vocational training as early as around seven years old. Hartley Adams believes this helps students become well-rounded. You have two streams of students, some who are highly academic and some who are academic but skill-oriented. So we have to look at this mix because we cannot develop um, Dominica in the 21st century without having our skills. That's important because, as you know, uh, we are now crying out for plumbers, electricians, tile layers, you know, we cannot even find them. So it's important that at primary school level, the students are exposed to a certain level of skills. We should start doing that immediately. We should not wait again. We had it before at the primary level, which we call the JSP, uh, but we, we lost it along the way. So I still, I'm still saying that we need now to probably bring it even at the grade three level three, four, five, six, so by the time they transit into the secondary school, they already have skills that they can work with. 
He dispelled the view that the junior secondary program, or JSP, was for unintelligent students. I always believe that um, we should move along the stream, like for instance, not only academic, but the students should be able to learn skills because we're moving into a scientific age. People had the notion that skills was just for the persons who are drop out. No, that's a misconception because, you know, skills requires a certain mathematical concepts, certain um, ideas in terms of your literature. You have to be able to read your plans and so on. You're watching Channel 5 News coming up. More news, sports, and your weather update. Investigations continue into the shooting death of Glenn Alphonse of Girodel. Alphonse was reportedly shot while on a bus on Wednesday. He is said to have died on his way to the hospital. Two men were reportedly involved in the shooting, but no official police report yet to indicate whether there has been any arrest in connection with that shooting. And cassava farmers and uh, processors are being promised the necessary incentives to up their game in the processing and export of the crop. Dominica is facing competition from other countries in the cassava export trade because of difficulties meeting certain standards for the international market. The Agriculture Minister is concerned and has given his word that his ministry will work with cassava farmers to reform the business as the business as usual approach in exporting cassava and cassava flour or farine. We have competition out there. There are other countries producing cassava. They are beating us, not in quality, but they are beating us on the standards as far as labeling um, and packaging is concerned. We have to improve on our standard here, so that we can take advantage of this opportunity. It's my hope we can work with a core group of farmers in the same way we are now working with a core group of farmers for the banana subsector. We can now work with a core group of farmers who are committed to the cassava sector and they will get the, all the technical support they need and um, to include fertilizers and all, which they do nothing much of, to include better facilities so that they can plant their cassava over a period of time, staggering the plant for want of a better word. And they will always have cassava to harvest. Drago noted, however, it's not a case where government has not assisted the local cassava processing industry at all. The state's aid includes a $50,000 investment in upgrading cassava processing plants. Well, we are meeting um, um, the, some of the standards, but there is always room for improvement. Um, we have upgraded the facility for the farmers. As, as we said, the European Union invested $250,000 in establishing two cassava processing plants. The government of Dominica invested an additional $50,000 in, in assisting small plants in upgrading the, their facility, bringing water to the facility, um, ensuring that there is adequate space for the farmers to operate um, while processing, building the boxes that they need for storage of cassava, for um, giving them um, modern um, press um, facility so that they could, they could drain out all the water out of the cassava at a faster pace. As you know, in the past we used to use stones on wood. Now they have this um, facility that they now use. Meantime, the next three years will afford increased opportunities for cassava farmers to boost their production. This is made possible through a project for the Food and Agriculture Organization, a 1.2 million US dollar project funded by the Caribbean Development Bank. The project manager said Dominica, along with Trinidad and Suriname, was chosen to benefit from the project because of the customary practice of its indigenous people cultivating the crop. So at the heads of government level in 2014, we embarked on a response to a mandate at the CARICOM level to focus on priority commodities and roots and tubers at the CARICOM level of heads was identified and cassava. We held a regional conference. Out of the regional conference were discussions on potential collaboration opportunities and the bank, Deve Development Bank, in, in their own initiative in taking in the information presented um, develop the project, identifying Dominica as a small whole island, an island that has indigenous peoples, 
um, allowing us to reach the persons in, in the region who do cassava at an indigenous level. Um, similarly, in Suriname, we have a significant indigenous population that grow cassava. And Trinidad, with the successes they had had in the past, um, 2008 up to 2012, 13, 14, uh, lent itself to be an opportunity to partner with the bank as one of the countries uh, to expand and share the information, taking into account the indigenous populations, um, having the, having, knowing that cassava was so core of their production. A focus will be on improving the processing of cassava and introducing various cassava byproducts. The production com component uh, has Im importation of new varieties, if Dominica so wishes, uh, testing of the varieties, um, e training of extension officers and farmers using the farmer field school methodology for cassava production. We are currently identifying the markets that we will be addressing, but it looks very likely that we will be looking at um, uh, cassava bread, like slice loaf, which we have done in other countries of the Caribbean, in Barbados with great success, with Grenada, in Grenada. Uh, Trinidad has already done that on their own, uh, but FAO projects and CARDI projects have um, introduced the sliced cassava loaf bread with 40% uh, substitution of wheat, up to 40% with cassava, grated cassava, what we call cassava mash. And the 48 students who officially bid farewell to Goodwill Secondary School have been told not to allow negative views of their school to keep them from doing great things in the future. The words of advice came from featured speaker and attorney at law, Vanika Sobas Joseph. The theme for the graduation ceremony was the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. People say only those who go to certain schools can succeed. You can prove them otherwise. I am proof otherwise. I have classmates who are successful entrepreneurs, who are international managers with major global companies. And this is not just your stat. This is not just your stat. You are a seed grown by Goodwill Secondary. You will work for the future to build yourself and build your country. Your future is yours. And it is yours to build, it is yours to dream. Believe in the beauty of your dreams. Plan your future, work at it, and you will achieve. At Wednesday's graduation, Miguel Arena was named valedictorian, while Anton Francis was salutatorian of the graduating class of 2017. And one of Dominica's top performing CVQ centers is set to see an upgraded facility and student performance. This, as a promise, has been renewed to the Goodwill Secondary School, which is the Caribbean Vocational Qualification Center for Garment Making on the island. At the graduation ceremony of the GSS on Wednesday, Education Minister Peter Saint-Jean commended staff and principal for taking the CVQ program seriously and producing outstanding results. Goodwill Secondary School does not only prepare its students for life, but Goodwill Secondary School prepares students for the real world. This is especially obvious with the ongoing Caribbean Vocational Qualifications CVQ program in garment production right there at the, second, the Goodwill Secondary School. Your school now stands out as a flagship school for garment production in Dominica. And my ministry is looking forward to providing you with all of the support that is required to continue growth in that program. The minister said government remained committed to the holistic development of students at the Goodall Secondary School and reminded them that plans to build a new school were still on the cards. You and your peers, you are no longer limited to the basic maths and science but also to information technology, crop production, food preparation. And if you are so inclined, cosmetology, I hope that you and those who come after you will grab those opportunities to broaden your scope and become competitive. I wish to advise that plans are currently in an advanced stage for the construction 
of what will be Dominica's most modern school for the delivery of high quality secondary education on the island. That's news, your sports highlights next with Kenny Williams. First up in sports, West Indies tasted the wrath of a determined Indian side with an unbeaten century from Virat Kohli, which helped his team beat the home side by eight wickets in the fifth One Day International on Thursday. The Windies took first knock and were limited to 205 for nine. Shai Hope managed 51, Kyle Hope 46, Captain Jason Holder 36, and Ravman Powell 31. Mohamed Shami took 4 for 48 and Umesh Yadav 3 for 53. Set 206 to win, India scored 206 for 2 in 36.5 overs. India's skipper was undefeated on 111, while Danish Kati was not out on 50. Abrahani scored 39. Azari Joseph picked up 1 for 39 and Devendra Bishu 1 for 42. India won the 5 match series 3-1. Meantime, West Indies women suffered yet another defeat in the ICC World Cup when New Zealand won the 16th match by eight wickets on Thursday. West Indies was sent into bat and was bowled out for a mere 150 runs from 43 overs. Kishona Knight's 41 and Afi Fletcher's unbeaten 23 were the only scores of note. Set a likely 151 for victory, New Zealand equaled the target in just 18.2 overs with two wickets fallen. Rachel Priest had the hot hand for the New Zealanders with 90 and Susie Bates 40 not out. Stephanie Taylor and Anisha Mohammed took one wicket each. Their next assignment will be against Sri Lanka on Sunday. On the basketball scene, Kyrie FM Old School stole the spotlight in the only game possible in the 2017 Flow DABA League on Wednesday. Old School boasted scores of 81 to 66 against Detroit Blazers with a win on Blazers' home court. Scoring for Old School, we had Levi Barron netting a game high of 28 points, while Jenna Deschamps closely supported with 26 and Damien Sorrendo, who added 15. In a home court losing effort, Blazers' Kelly McPherson scored 14, Nathan Sebastian 12, and Mitchell Prevo 11. The second game was called off due to rain. Weather permitting, Friday's games will feature Sports Division's inter-school team up against Lindo Park X-Men in the Division 1 at 7, followed by a Premier League clash of the Police Sports Club and Flow X-Men at 9. Both games are scheduled for the Massac Hardcourt. On the football scene, Dominica's under-15 team bounced back from Tuesday's defeat when they beat Barbados 1-0 in their second warm-up match on Wednesday. Cadmel Paul scored the lone goal for Dominica. Barbados had to replace St. Lucia since they did not arrive on the island on Wednesday as planned. Those warm-up games formed part of the under-15's preparation for the 2017 CONCACAF Boys Tournament in August. The Dominica Football Association began the under-15's preparation for the August tournament with a league which began in January this year. On to local cricket, teams will get a chance to earn bragging rights soon when the 2017 Big Edge Gifford Tusa Softball Cricket League enters its semi-final stage this weekend. On Sunday, there will be double headers. The fifth semi-final will be played at 10 o'clock in the morning. That is, that is VF Inc. versus P7 Ericans. And that match, as I said, is scheduled for 10 o'clock in the morning at the Brooklyn Playing Field. And from 2 o'clock, we will see the second semi-finals, and that will be between the Cornell Sports Club versus Ray Charles Wu Security Point Michel at 2 o'clock in the afternoon at the Brooklyn Plain Field. So Next up, a national player and the head coach of Dominica's table tennis team, Edgar Berridge, says the national team is in intense preparation mode ahead of the upcoming Caribbean Senior and Mini Cadet competitions. The games feature some of the region's best as well as international players. A crop of players had recently been selected for training that showed good skills at the Grand Prix event here. After the first Grand Prix, the association have selected players for training and this commenced last week where we had a, a, a crop of players that actually played the Grand Prix. They came for training, so they have been training. We've been doing some very good training, yeah, and 
they showed some very good sign. I mean, it's going to be a very tough fight out there against top players, top teams in the Caribbean, and not only top team. They actually, for this tournament, you find they have international players that some countries actually bring down to 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 play for for the country. The full squad is expected to be announced soon. Players will get a chance to earn a world ranking at the competition. The full squad will be named in the next two days, and then from next week. The training we're going to have will be only the team players. And the nice thing about the Caribbean Championship right now, well, it started last year, is it is of um, world ranking. It means that if you perform, you can get a world ranking based on your performance. And that's the nice thing about the Caribbean um, Championship right now. The Caribbean Senior Championship is carded for Cuba from July 18 to 24. The Caribbean Mini Cadet is scheduled for Jamaica and runs from August 24 to 28. That's all the sporting highlights for now. I am Kenny Williams. Join us next time. Coming up, your weather update. Good evening, viewers. Welcome to tonight's weather broadcast. I am Janelle McPherson. In first satellite imagery today showed this area of multi-layered clouds associated with a tropical wave. Visible satellite imagery today showed partly cloudy to cloudy skies across Dominica. Radar imagery indicated widely scattered showers across the island chain today. The weather for tonight increasingly cloudy with scattered showers. This is as a result of a tropical wave. These conditions will continue into tomorrow with a chance of isolated thunderstorms. Seas tomorrow, moderate in open water, waves peaking up to 7 feet. Looking ahead for the next three days, cloudiness, showers and a chance of isolated thunderstorms are expected on Friday and Sunday. Throughout the Caribbean tomorrow, Cloudy skies, scattered showers and possible isolated thunderstorms are expected across the southern portion of the island chain. On the international cities forecast, rain expected in New York, thunderstorm activity for Miami and Caracas, partly cloudy skies in London and clear skies in Beijing. Sunrise tomorrow at 5.40 a.m. and sunset at 6.40 p.m. For up-to-date weather information, please call our weather hotline at 447-5555 or visit our website at weather.gov.dm. Thank you for viewing and have a good night. And to end the news, the headlines again. The case regarding the 2016 robbery of a million dollars in Rolex watches at Jewelers International has been dismissed. A pledge to bring much-needed reforms to cassava production and marketing and progress in mountain chicken conservation. Feel free to contact us at news at mapping2k4.com. You can access our past newscasts on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the production team, I am Julian Morris. To our viewers around the world, thank you for watching.